The United States has long encouraged the production of alternative fossil fuels. When I worked at a farm supply cooperative in the mid-1970s, we had something called gasohol, and all of the state patrol vehicles in the state of Minnesota were required to buy gasohol at that time. Um, the United States was trying to find a way to become less reliant on imports of crude oil. We were very reliant prior to the oil run-up crisis of 1973 and 1974. After that, we started focusing on what could we do with corn and make gasohol to reduce our imports from the Middle East primarily and help make us more self-reliant in fuel. The belief at the time was that ethanol made from corn was more environmentally friendly, and, but the reality is production was very minimal until the mid-2000s. There's a lot of data on this topic. I've got a website here listed that's done by the Department of Energy which creates a whole bunch of information, everything from the mileage on fuel, uh, different vehicles and so forth over time, production issues, demand issues. It's a fascinating website if you've got some time to stop and look at. One of the issues with the Clean Water Act or Clean Air Act um, after 1990 was the issue of MTBE and oxygenated fuels. If you happen to do a lot of driving across the United States, the lower 48 states, I should say, what you'll see is that different regions have got required different levels of oxygenated fuels. Um, these are added in unleaded gasoline to help it burn cleaner and keep the air more um, less polluted. And so what you find is you're going to find oxygenated fuels, 87 percent, 88 percent, 90 percent. And MTBE was the additive that was used to achieve this oxygenated fuel policy. The issue was it was very soluble in water. In the early 2000s, we started finding more and more examples around areas where we had uh, drinking supplies of water. We're finding MTB in the water. And so as part of the Energy Policy Act of 2005, Congress said, look, we don't want to use MTBE anymore to achieve your oxygenated fuel. What can we do to, uh, as a substitute for MTBE? And most refiners started switching to uh, ethanol, most of this was coming from corn to, achieve, to increase the oxygen content and meet the standard. This was called the Renewable Fuel Standard or the RFS. So the RFS was created under the Energy Policy Act of 2005 and basically said was we're going to take a certain amount of renewable fuels and we're going to try to reduce the quantity of petroleum-based transportation fuel, heating, jet fuel in our economy and we're going to allow this renewable fuels to come from four sources. Biomass-based uh, diesel or biodiesel, cellulosic, cellulostic biodiesel, uh, advanced biofuels, and then the total number of renewable fuels. And then in 2007, we increased the size of that program and it had some uh, big changes. And we set some long-term goals. So part of the, the mid-2000s, what you saw was this whole emphasis on trying to move to more and more renewable fuels in our economy, and that led to things down the road. Then we started talking about solar and, and, and reduction of coal uh, burning plants and so forth. But we had these volume requirements, and you're going to see here shortly what that means in terms of what happened with this program. So Congress dictated that by the year 2022, we would have 36 billion gallons of renewable fuels. And it was going to come in these different buckets here based on this graph. And so as the industry evolved, we were going to try to see more and more use of um, cellulosic ethanol. And we would use the renewables like corn, which was the most common, or grain sorghum in some cases, but mostly corn. Um, the lighter green was going to uh, be reduced as we moved to more and more cellulosic. So one of the issues with trying to trace renewable fuel is once you've got gasoline at the pump, as a consumer is pumping that gas, you don't know what in there is ethanol, what is unleaded gasoline from petroleum. So a market was developed using something called RINs, or these renewable identification numbers. These were required to be attached to the unleaded gasoline sold in the market. And these RINs were produced by blending the ethanol at a refinery or purchasing it from those who have excess ethanol use capacity. So as part of that process, refiners and importers um, created renewable identification numbers or, or bought those and a market developed along these. And that's very important, as you're going to see here in the next couple slides. So at the time this was developed in 2005, 2006, there was a lot of discussion saying, you know, in the future, 
Most of our renewables were going to come from corn, but more importantly, we're going to come from cellulosic sources. So we thought to ourselves, we're going to use switchgrass. That was the most common type of thing that people thought about. We would take switchgrass and ferment that through different processes and convert that into a renewable fuel. And a lot of research was done in that 2005, 2006, 7, 8, 9, 2010 time period. We're still trying to figure out how to scale cellulosic ethanol. So to go back to the previous slide, at the time we signed this bill in 2007, we thought the technology was there that we would have this big list, this big group of cellulosic ethanol. We're not going to achieve that. The technology just isn't there right now to scale that up. So corn ethanol, meanwhile, was becoming more and more efficient. And so that became the, the substitute for MTBE. The other thing going on at the time was people started, after the Great Recession of 2008 and 2009, people started looking more consciously at what they drove. So we had people using more energy efficient cars, ride sharing programs developed. Um, and this re reduced household income. People just were saying, I'm not going to drive so far. In the Twin Cities here, St. Paul, Minneapolis, it was estimated in 2009 that about 10% of all the cars were not driving on the road compared to late 2007. So there's less congestion, um, and so people weren't buying as much on uh, gasoline. And so the, the, the mandate for the corn ethanol was not, um, was come, was not, was not happening. So the reduction on lead of gasoline meant that the congressional volume targets of 2005 and 2007 were more than what we had anticipated. And so what was going on was, and the other thing problem we had was, we had E10, so 10% ethanol blends. It was unclear whether warranties in older cars could use an, uh, an ethanol blend beyond 10%. And so people were worried about the warranties. Um, and so a number of things were going on in this market but the, the, funner, the underlying cause was the demand for unleaded glass gasoline was not what we thought it was going to be. And here's a way how to show that. Uh, this is a graph from that website I referred to early in this, this lecture. And what you see is going on is the ethanol number of plants went through a big expansion. A number of those plants were built in Minnesota. This red line is their capacities. The blue line is the production going on in those. But what you're seeing is that um, the, uh, um, the requirement became greater than demand in 2012. So the, 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 going back to that earlier graph where I said Congress was, was going to require a certain amount of corn ethanol be produced, that requirement was greater than what the demand was going on. And so and the, and the other thing going on was there was no cellulosic ethanol. That was not ramping up production like we thought. And so what happened was those RIN prices that we talked about started, they were at zero essentially prior to 2012. After 2012, refiners were forced to buy these in order to comply with the mandate, even though the demand wasn't there. And these RIN prices became greater than zero. The market, the buying and selling of these resulted in a higher price than what people had thought about. When the original market was developed, we thought these would hover around zero, and so no one really thought about that. We saw a lot of volatility going on because people were being forced to abide by this congressional mandate. Um, so small refiners were handicapped because they had to purchase RINs. They weren't able to sell enough of their mandate, uh, blend into that mandate. So one way to think about these using real numbers was we had gasoline consumption in 2017, about 142 billion gallons or so. At a 10% blend, that would have required 14.2 billion gallons of ethanol. And this would have been called E10 or 10% ethanol. The congressional legislation said that 15 billion gallons should be used, not 14.2. And therefore, we had a gap of 800 million gallons. Congress said that the fuel had to carry um, 15 billion gallons of ethanol when the market only said we, we need 14.2. And so how do you fulfill that? So we, we, what you're seeing with those two numbers is we can't fulfill that with an E10 mandate. We're going to have to sell some ethanols, E85, with 85% um, ethanol, or we're going to have to increase the blend into E15, or 15% ethanol. Um, and so because, uh, 
warranties weren't set up yet for E15. A lot of cars were not flex fuel, so they couldn't use the E85 to begin with. The options for filling this conventional gap were far more expensive, and so you saw a positive in price going up here. Um, some research at Columbia University said that the, the volatility was caused because of the structure of the RFS. No one saw that this demand was going to drop off, um, and also no one really thought much about the warranty issues and how the E10 versus E15 versus E85 would, would come to pass. And the other part about this was there were people were guessing about what Congress might do in the future. So they were hoping that Congress would allow more E15 blends out there. They were hoping that we'd have these blender pups that would go into to, um, um, business. And people were lobbying Congress as a way to make money off these different RIN um, uh, prices. Um, these blender pumps, one of the things you're going to see, if you've driven in, in um, Minnesota here or Wisconsin last year or so, you're going to see brand new truck stops like Quick Trip. Quick, Quick Trip is now setting up all their pumps so you can use E85, E10, or E15. Quick Trip goes through a lot of unleaded gasoline. They're able to take advantage because they generate so many of these RINs that people have to buy from them at a positive price. They're then taking, it's said that they're taking this, this money from these positive RIN prices and converting it back into their gasoline stations and opening up brand new um, organizations, uh, truck stops with fuel pumps to run these different types of blends. Employees like working there, they've got a very good business model, it seems like, from my perception um, at this point in time here in 2019. Um, there's a lack of consumer education. So in my, I had a Ford Escape. It was unclear to me if I could use 85. My uh, Ford F-150 that a brother had, they were set up to handle E85, but not all Ford vehicles were. So there was a number of confusion about these higher blends. What could work? E15, E10. In small engines, for example, if you're going to burn a snowmobile or a lawnmower, could you use something greater than uh, E10? Or was it, was it old enough that you had to use the 91 octane? So the other part about this is you can't make an apples to apples comparison at the pump. So when you see the price on E85 versus E10 versus E15 versus 91 octane, you can't make it a comparison between your gas mileage and the savings you would have by using E85, for example. E85, for example, is going to give you a much lower gas, um, uh, miles per hour of gas, relative to something that might be E10. But when you do that, you can't, there's no way mathematically to make that instant conversion. It's different for different types of vehicles. It's different based on the climate. The wintertime, you're going to have lower gas mileage. So a consumer doesn't know when they're buying gasoline what to buy and how to make a comparison if it makes more cost-effective sense to use 85 or do what you've always done, which is buy E10. Um, and so it just become very difficult as we got more and more different types of, of gasoline out there. People don't know necessarily what's going to work in their vehicle. Um, so as you think about all these issues, the renewal fuel standard was passed at a, at a time period when we were very much thinking about renewal fuels. It's accomplished a lot of good things. We had to find a substitute for MTBE, which was hurting some of our uh, groundwater and drinking supplies. And corn ethanol right now is the only substitute we've really got for it. The cellulosic type things are still futuristic. We still don't know how to scale those up and, and make things from algae or make things from switchgrass or other types of, of things. So for the foreseeable future, to meet that requirement is going to require more and more corn ethanol. We were exporting corn ethanol to China. Um, that trade was shut off in, in uh, um, early 2016. It's unclear right now in, in March of 2019 whether or not China will contribute to or will go back and purchase corn ethanol. So we've developed a great big global market for corn ethanol, um, produced in the United States and shipped to other places. We import some corn ethanol from Brazil made from sugarcane, and then on the west coast we're exporting some corn ethanol into Brazil um, using corn. So it's a fascinating market when you start looking at it. Some of the things that have been happened in the last six months um, have brought down the prices of the RINs as some of the small refiner exemptions from having to buy those in excess and so forth. Um, so that's in a nutshell a quick summary of the renewable fuel standard.